so I would like to uh, introduce this, the keynote speaker of today, Dr. Joe Chamberlain. Uh, last evening, uh, we were doing a practice run for this event, and our past president, Ravi, called uh, Dr. Chamberlain the rock star of the aquaculture world. <laughs> <laughs> Most of you know who Dr. Chamberlain is. What you may not know is that he has been unfortunate twice in his long career. I have worked under him on two different occasions. And the first time was my first job. And he was to teach me all that I know about the aquafeed business today. During that period, Dr. Chamberlain was building the Global Aquaculture Alliance. I had started as an intern and was given a desk in a small library in the R&D department. And this was right across from Dr. Chamberlain's office. And Dr. Chamberlain had the habit of keeping his office door open and speaking loudly. So I could hear him getting on calls with decision makers in the aquaculture sector worldwide and explaining the reason for a global aquaculture advocacy group and asking for commitments of support. Frequently, he would refer to what was happening in India with the Supreme Court ruling against shrimp culture Today, about a quarter century later, GA has grown to be the most influential organization in aquaculture. As Bill Gates rightly said, most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do it in 10 years. Dr. Chamberlain's tenacity is an inspiration for those of us in SAP who want to unite all aquaculture professionals in India under one banner to promote aquaculture. Let me now welcome Dr. Ch Joe Chamberlain, the president of GAA, to deliver the keynote address for the theme of this webinar, Global Shrimp Markets Looking Beyond the Pandemic. Welcome, George. Thank you, Victor. Let's see if, um, if we can share the screen. Okay. <clears throat> Victor, are you able to see my screen? Yes, it's clear. Okay, perfect. Always makes me a little bit nervous when we have these uh, technical glitches, but um, I'm delighted to, to be here with you. And Victor, thank you for the kind words. And it was such an inspiration when you joined our team and uh, at Purina, and it's been a pleasure working with you and with uh, Ravi and Muthu and Santana and all the other uh, gentlemen at SAP. And I would say the same wonderful things about the organization that you've formed. You've taken it from uh, a very small group that could fit in one small room. I remember making one of the initial presentations to SAP to a world-class organization, absolutely top-notch. So congratulations. Well, let me, um, let me begin by giving a quick introduction about GAA. These are some of the programs. You know, I'd say we're best known for our certification program. You see at the bottom, the best aquaculture practices. Um, but I want, to, I want to draw your attention to two things. Uh, membership, and I think you've heard it before that GAA is trying to reach out and establish strategic partner members with associations around the world. And the idea is that we think that collaboration, networking, information exchange is the power that will advance the business. Um, there's no need for all of the expertise to be in one area. We can connect, we can network. And that's, that know-how is what will grow the business. So we want to try to link everyone together. And, and the idea is that any member of any aquaculture association, whether it's farming, hatchery, feed, processing, or marketing, uh, is, is invited to join with us to form a, a consortium so that we can all share information. And, and those members, uh, everyone has free access to the information benefits of GAA, including 
live streaming of the first day of the Gold Conference. And I've included here a few pictures of what uh, some of the talks on the first day, some of the exciting, bold new ventures, like these um, RAS, recirculating aquaculture systems for salmon that are um, attempting to revolutionize the way that salmon is produced using land-based systems. And then the open ocean, fully exposed offshore production systems for salmon like the Ocean Farm 2. And then homegrown shrimp. This is CP's uh, indoor shrimp farm that they built in Florida. And they expect to have many of these, all totally research, including the hatchery totally research. And then Min Fu's intensive outdoor tank system, which is kind of a hybrid between a, uh, a research, indoor research system and an intensive outdoor farm. All of these getting very high yields, very exciting. So I, I hope you'll join us as a strategic partner member. It's very easy. The association joins. We send the association a link that they send to their members with a few clicks, you're signed up. And then join us for the goal meeting, October 6 to 8. Now, <clears throat> before we get into marketing, I just want to focus on the, the terrible toll on, on humanity that COVID has taken. 31 million people have been uh, infected with 300,000 new infections per day. Can you imagine nearly 1 million deaths so far? And if you look at that plot on the right, you can see this on a global scale, this is changing with exponential growth phase and then a plateau as there seems to be some control and then another exponential growth phase. And we're still not sure if it's peaked. It, there may yet be another exponential growth phase as we head into the winter period. And countries around the world are in varying stages of lockdowns and some are relaxing controls, some are tightening. And certainly some countries have been more effective than others. And I would say both India and the US, unfortunately, are examples of countries that have not been very effective in controlling this disease so far. We don't expect life to return to normal soon. The herd immunity is with the vaccine is probably going to be at least 12 months away. Hopefully the vaccine will be available sooner, but it'll go to first responders. It's going to be at least a year before the general public can get it and probably longer because we have to think about getting it distributed worldwide. Otherwise, infected people moving internationally will still spread the disease. The impacts on the seafood sector are many. Even though COVID doesn't infect seafood, it indirectly affects it in so many ways. And we've, we've heard about the surface contamination of the RNA of the COVID virus on packaging of seafood in China and how that's caused major market disruption. And of course, the food service channel has been hit so hard and Angel gave some great information that really puts numbers on this. And it's had a tre you know, tremendous impact on traditional wet markets. That basically shut down, but the retail and e-commerce have, have grown tremendously. And there are big issues with logistics and movement of people, the workforce in processing plants. Hey, hey, I want to take a moment to mention that no, on no, no. safety, hey, we hey, see hey, issues hey, at, hey, um, at hey, processing plants where people are working. Um, I, I hear some voices in the background. I wonder if I could ask uh, everyone to try to mute so that we can get some clear sound. Anyway, they're um, uh, gaining control of uh, worker safety at processing plant is very important. And I think um, 
great progress is being made in that regard. You know, looking forward, we know that uh, the economy is um, worsening. Uh, consumer budgets will be tight. As Angel pointed out, the seafood is much more expensive than terrestrial proteins. And uh, we might see a more conscious, budget conscious public uh, beginning to shift to cheaper proteins. Um, consumers are learning to prepare seafood at home. In the long run, this is going to go away and where aquaculture is going to be positioned to provide a healthy food source uh, for the future and, and the long-term prospects are great. It's this shorter term that we have to get through for the next at least six months. Angel showed uh, uh, lots of different price curves, but let me just show this one where the red line shows the pricing and you can see the sensitivity of pricing to volume at that area that's circled. Uh, you can see there was a bump in volume. The bars show the volume from 2017 to 2018. The volume of global shrimp production went up 11% and you can see price dropped at the same time 12%. Uh, volume and price are very interlinked. And the key point now is that we are very close to the historic low price levels. This is a difficult time for producers around the world. And then when we look at per capita consumption in the US, how much each person eats, we can see that for a long period of time, say from about 2003 to 2018, maybe at least 15 years, per capita consumption has been flat, even though global production has uh, nearly doubled. So we're not getting the consumption results. And this is the whole purpose of this talk is to think about marketing, improving consumption. And on top of this, we're, we're experiencing these great improvements in technology. Um, RAS systems, uh, much higher yields. There's the potential for shrimp farming to produce a lot more volume. We're investing a lot in technology, but we're not investing in marketing. Now I wanna introduce the real rock star of shrimp marketing. It's this gentleman. Uh, his name is Alan Cooper. Uh, he is the former uh, manager of uh, Compasol's avocado business in Peru. Compasol is one of the largest agricultural companies in Peru. They sell some of the superfoods like blueberries, asparagus, and avocados. And then they moved into shrimp farming and they gave Alan a promotion to manage their shrimp farming business. But he had previously come from the avocado business where he understood marketing. And he asked me questions as we sat here in Lima. What do you guys in shrimp farming do about marketing? And what's your plan? And he began to realize that we don't have a unified plan. And he was surprised and he began to tell me about what happens in the avocado business. And I asked him if he could present that at the goal meeting in, uh, in Guayaquil, Ecuador in 2018. So at that meeting, he described his company's shrimp farming venture called Marina Sol, where they've taken standard semi-intensive ponds like the ones you see in the background here and converted them into covered intensive ponds with very low water exchange and very high yields. It's amazing, uh, sophisticated work, and it's the future of shrimp farming, I believe. But then he talked about avocados, and he explained that in the history of avocado production, there was variable quality product would enter the market, it was already overripe. Uh, consumers were worried that when it changed color, maybe it's rotten. 
there were health concerns. Are the fats and avocados bad for you? There's very poor data on the supply of avocados, very poor understanding of the seasonal peaks in demand. So there would be excess avocados in the market when it wasn't needed, an insufficient supply when it was needed, and a very limited use of avocados, mainly for Mexican cuisine, for, for guacamole, for example. And then the avocado producers got together and they formed a U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, marketing board for avocados. Now understand that USDA has about 22 different marketing boards for all the major commodity foods. You see here, chicken, eggs, pork, beef, milk, potatoes, cotton, soybeans, citrus, flowers, nuts, mangoes, many, many. And the idea here is to bring some order and to bring some <clears throat> organization and um, uh, uh, help the producers to do a better job with marketing their products. And what USDA does is set up a mandatory process. If the producers meet certain criteria, then a system can be put in place where every single pound or kilo of product entering the U.S. market is assessed a small fee, a few cents. Let's say in the case of avocados, two and a half cents per pound. That money goes into a fund and then the fund is used to do all sorts of work on research, marketing, data collection, and research with all these commodities that I've mentioned, all 22 of these, show that the benefit to cost ratio of these programs is generally in the range of four to one to six to one. In other words, you invest $1 and you're gonna get four to $6 in benefits. So in the avocado case, the first thing that USDA does is they grade all the imported foods. So they graded the avocados. Is it grade A, grade B, or grade C? And that had the immediate effect of all the exporters wanting to make sure they got maximum value. So it drove the industry to consistently produce grade A. So the quality issues were largely resolved. Then they invested in health research and they found that the fats and avocados weren't bad for you, they were actually good for you. And the American Heart Association, AHA, granted use of their Heart Healthy logo on avocado marketing. So it was a complete turnaround. And we have a similar situation with shrimp. Can you imagine some people still worry about the cholesterol in shrimp? Imagine if we could turn that around and show this is good cholesterol. It's the high density li lipids and we could get a heart healthy logo for shrimp. And then they worked on the data. Now they have accurate data on all the sources of avocados coming in and they know when the peaks in supply are and they've developed lots of new product forms, avocado salad, avocado toast, avocado smoothies, avocado ice cream, avocado oil. It's just incredible. Now this slide shows you the typical data. This is public information. You can go on the Hass Avocado Marketing Board site and it will show you what the past imports were from each source, California, Mexico, Chile, Dominican Republic, New Zealand, Peru, and what the future are expected to be every week. So you, you get to, uh, you, you know, if you're a retailer and you're expecting that you're going to need X volume, you can go on the website and you can see, wow, yeah, it looks like uh, no problem. There's plenty of volume coming in. Very accurate information. And so in just six years, the per capita consumption nearly doubled. Can you imagine we've been, what did we say earlier, 15 years, almost flat? So remarkable change by driving consumption. 
and doing all the homework. It takes money, but everybody contributes equally and a very small amount. So after the rock star Alan Cooper gave his presentation at the goal meeting, at that very meeting, the audience, members of the audience said, let's get together and do something. So spontaneously, a shrimp marketing organizing committee was established. I don't know if you can see, but this is uh, Alan Cooper right here. And this group decided, let's try to follow the avocado example and do it for shrimp. And the group considered various funding models. There's the voluntary model, like everybody, please chip in. But the problem with that, it, they just don't work because you, you'll always have the case of free riders. Those are the people who say, wow, I really like the program, but this is not, not a good time for my company. Uh, we, uh, we really can't contribute. Uh, my company really doesn't need this kind of marketing. We're fine without it. Uh, many, many reasons. And next thing you know, there are only a few uh, contributing and carrying the burden of the whole industry, and they quickly decide that they're not going to do that, and the, and the program falls apart. We also tried an idea of a buyer-driven program, having the major buyers, uh, let's say uh, Cisco Foods, Costco, Walmart, you know, the major buyers um, require it. You must contribute to this. But that runs into problems with antitrust. The buyers simply are legally not allowed to do that, although some of them indicated they were willing to. So it brings us back to the mandatory model. But what this organizing committee had concerns about were two things. First of all, to get a marketing board established, 75% of the importers on the US side, they must vote in favor of it. So you have to get the majority of the business on board. And some of those importers were concerned that if they invite USDA in to help with marketing, maybe USDA might creep into a regulatory role and maybe they would add another layer of reg regulations that the importers don't want. Now that's very unlikely because it's a completely different arm of the U.S. Department of Agriculture that handles marketing boards, but nevertheless it, it's a concern. And consequently nothing has happened with that organizing committee, I'm, uh, I'm sad to say. After quite a bit of work, those committee members met multiple times uh, in the U.S. and also came to Chennai for the goal meeting and met again there, met with exporters in Chennai. Um, and and I, I must say that this generic marketing that we're talking about is a long-term proposition. What we hear is that it generally takes about two years to gain approval within a sector to convince everyone and to go through the paperwork and the bureaucracy to form a USDA marketing board. And people think, wow, two years, that's an awful long time. But you know what? It has been two years since we started that discussion. If we had moved forward immediately, we would already have the USDA marketing board. So we've lost some time. But then once the board is found and the funds begin to roll in, it takes several more years before you really start to see the tangible results. You begin to collect the data, you put the systems in place, you invest in research, but it takes time. So it's absolutely the right decision for companies that have a long-term plan to stay in this business and to grow their business. If you wanna grow the business, we have to have generic marketing. We have to have a way to increase consumption. Now, professionals and farmers invest enormous amounts of money and generations of time to find, harvest, or grow the very best product they can. 
and that Pronat, our Australian prawns, deserves the attention and love of the nation. Competing on price alone can be a race to the bottom that no one wins. But if you can tell your story, appeal to emotions and not just wallets, then you give people a real reason to love Australian prawns. And that is an investment in the future of the industry. The Love Australian Prawns campaign is the first national campaign for an entire seafood category. Prawn fishers and farmers are leading the seafood industry with unified and professional marketing. We gauge what sells in the shop and we gauge what the new customers are telling us. Uh, from what we've learned over the last 12 months, the campaign has worked, it's worked wonders and we can definitely see a demand for Australian prawns. So the point of that video was to show you that in the case of Australia, they've actually gone beyond just developing a marketing campaign for farmed shrimp. They've gotten their farmed and wild catch sectors to work together. That's just remarkable. It's a tremendous example of what is possible. I really do think that unified generic marketing is desperately needed in the shrimp business. It is a longer term effort but it's something that we have to begin. Uh, SAP has certainly shown the tenacity to form an organization and grow it. And we need leadership from, from you to show that you feel this is important and uh, continue to, to drive it through with the importers in, on the US side. So let me wrap up. Uh, the COVID pandemic is really hitting us worldwide, especially the food service sector. Prices are right now at historic lows. Um, the, remarkably, the shrimp farming technology continues to improve. We're making tremendous advancements on the whole, the whole gamut of shrimp farming, from disease control, diagnostic measurements, breeding, uh, hatchery technology, feeds, uh, the whole thing is improving, but we're not doing anything on marketing. And without this unified generic marketing, supply will continue to go up and pr prices will continue to fall. Now this avocado model that we've discussed, um, uh, that Alan Cooper explained to us, is a wonderful example of the improvements that can be made with proper data collection, understanding the market, and driving per capita consumption. I think that a mandatory model, mandatory collection of a fee upon import of product and a very small fee that everyone pays the same amount, that that is the necessary model. And that is a long-term solution, not a quick fix. It won't help us this year, and it probably won't help us much for three to five years. But then we have something that can grow the business for the long-term. So thank you very much. A pleasure talking with you today, and I look forward to the questions that come later. Thank you, George, for the wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, what we got to understand from George's presentation is uh, we need to have a unified marketing body. You know, I mean, probably uh, US on USDA lines, USDA has uh, marketing boards for several commodities. If we can start something like that, definitely is going to help because the markets are stagnant. I mean, if we want to up our ante in any of the shrimp farming countries, we don't have the market. It is stagnant. So definitely we need to work on that kind of a, a, a board. And we have to take a leaf out of the book of avocado, you know. I mean, there's such an example. We have to take leaves out of the book and try to, uh, you know, implement, you know. I mean, we have a set precedent. It, it, it's up to us to follow, you know. We have to get united from uh, all the shim farming countries and come up with this unified board. Then everybody is going to benefit. I mean, it's going to help the larger good of uh, shim farming fraternity, you know. Wonderful thoughts, George. Yeah.